Hello and welcome everybody. This is Abdullah, co-founder of Silverline Community and your host to the Mean Who podcast, the show that sheds light on the movers, shakers and shapers of the creative and cultural industries. Today we kick off our new theme of our podcast series, Conceptualization. And who better to launch this with than Matthias Holwich, one of architecture's most visionary practitioners. Matthias leads the global architectural firm Hawken, a New York-based collective of architects, sculptors, social strategists, and innovators dedicated to use architecture to shape a better world. He was honored in Fast Company's ranking of the world's top 10 most innovative architects and in Business Insider's list of top 10 business visionaries. Matthias' latest book, New Aging, Live Smarter Now to Live Better Forever, suggests a new way to think about aging that fundamentally changes the way we design for it. His lectures on architecture, sustainability, and innovation have been featured at TED, Picnic, Stelka, and the Conscious City Conferences. Matthias, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. I'm very excited to be here. Wonderful. Would you share with us a bit about your background, please? Absolutely, yeah. So you may detect an accent. So I'm actually originally from Germany. Uh, I studied uh, and grew up in Germany. And then um, I wanted to go out into the world for two years. And uh, I wanted to be in New York for a year, which I did, uh, working for Peter Eisenman. Then I wanted to be in the Netherlands for a year, working for Ron Kohlhaas. And uh, I did that. But then uh, what happened, my time at Ron Kohlhaas was extended to three years, then I moved to Hong Kong, then I was teaching in Switzerland, then I moved to Amsterdam. And then 15 years ago, I came to New York and I started the architecture firm Hawken. And at Hawken, one of your pillars is forward thinking topologies. Uh, I would like you to further elaborate on this concept because I found it fascinating. Yeah, so a couple of years ago, we had the opportunity to actually reinvent some of the apartment topologies. Uh, That was actually with uh, WeWork at that time. We uh, developed the second generation of WeLive. And uh, we realized that with a lot of new thinking, you can come up with a lot of interesting new solutions. And we had a two-year R&D contract, and we went through potentially every different way how you could live. And uh, parallel, I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, and I looked into aging. And the book you had just mentioned, New Aging, was one of the results from it. But also there, um, I saw that there's a lot of innovation that you can bring into the realm of architecture when you look through the lens of older people. And uh, we realized that uh, with all of this kind of work, we were not just architects creating beautiful, exceptional buildings, uh, but we also were able to go deep into the DNA of these kind of products, typologies, and reinvent the way how we live and how we work and how we play. And uh, now it's one of our specialities and it's actually a lot of fun uh, to reinvent these kind of uh, typologies, especially now where the whole world is in flux, that COVID cracked open everything. And we saw that working from home is possible. Maybe we need more workspaces at home. We realized that all the people in nursing homes were the most vulnerable people who we need to protect And uh, we saw that cities were standing still and how we can address all of these kind of issues are now the big, big, big topics. And uh, we are in the middle of it right now, um, reinventing basically the future. Do you believe a lot of architecture firms who are supposed to be practicing architecture for the betterment of humanity follow your example even after COVID or do you feel there is a resistance so far still? I think there is an amazing creative energy in the architectural community. And uh, somehow most architects are idealists, right? Uh, we, we look into the future positively. We try to find solutions. And um, what maybe is the difference that we are incredible practical. Uh, that means there are fantastic series and I follow a lot of them and I'm very inspired by them. But then I always force myself and also my team towards real solutions that we can implement. And uh, that means that you have to run through hundreds of ideas and you have to then distill the ones that are really the front runners. 
And I think a lot of people stay maybe a little bit too idealistic in some of the topics and uh, go, don't go deeper into the market forces that are all around us. And uh, by acknowledging these kind of forces, we can actually tune up uh, some of the innovations, but sometimes we also have to say, maybe it's not yet the time, but we have it in our back of our minds. And then maybe in five years, it's the right moment uh, to implement these. How, how do you believe architecture help us conceptualize a better future for humanity on practical terms? I have two examples. One of them is uh, for the living environment, right? So a um, couple of years ago, by writing the book and also by researching a lot on aging, we came up with a new um, apartment topology where we were thinking, how can we actually bring different ages together, which are maybe not families, but maybe a chosen family or maybe an opportunistic family, right? Where you help each other because of other reasons. Um, and uh, we put that ahead uh, into in, uh, or out in the world and people were like, ah, okay, we like it, that's interesting. Um, but uh, we basically had that as kind of a, almost a theoretical approach. Now with the pandemic having passed through, everyone is paying attention to this topology. And we actually started a company which is called Flex uh, that is now developing this further with actually a lot of, uh, let's say, operational topics uh, and also uh, performance uh, within the kind of building uh, kind of solutions that we're developing. So it's not just hardware, it's software and also humanware. And that is uh, what now we have uh, really in our focus to develop not just the, the hardware, which is, of course, as an architect, it's very natural, but also being very aware that you have to have a magic sauce in it uh, that make all of the kind of dreams reality. Uh, and that means if you want to connect people with different ages who maybe don't know each other, we need kind of a methodology, how we create these connections, how we make people friends, how do we make people care for each other? And uh, there's actually a lot of things that we're learning right now from neuroscience. Uh, my business partner is actually Mark Gilmore. Uh, he's very passionate about it and very connected uh, to a lot of people in that field. And uh, we're working through these kind of details and elements. And on the other side, uh, there is the future of work, right? And the future of work, we can observe how we have changed the way how we work and how we engage with each other. Obviously, Zoom, virtual working, working from home, all of these kind of things. Uh, but now the question is, what is the possible, or how would you say, what are the positive things that we can take from our experiences and put them into a new way of working? And we have a very, very exciting project uh, in actually London. Uh, we won a big competition because we did not just present a building, we actually presented a new ideology. And uh, we call it actually uh, the first work resort. That means that you go to your office almost like what you do with a resort experience, right? You look forward to it, it's, it's hyperactive, it's socially connecting, but it also creates a embrace kind of quality of a culture that a resort normally kind of uh, generates. And when you go to the first work resort, you will be immersed in these kind of experiences. And uh, of course our hope, and we have to work very hard to it, uh, is that in the end, people want to go back to work and want to be part of that culture, but always have these choices uh, that you can also choose. You work from home, but the purposeful moments where you go back to the office and make that incredible, productive, social and rewarding. And the rewards are not just financial, uh, but the rewards are also experiential. And the rewards are also for a trajectory in the growth of your career. Uh, which is actually something very important what we found in our research. Is this this work resort concept, are you, is this some kind of a new theme or new ideology that you're launching and you hope to replicate? Yeah, good question. Uh, I, I think when we figured it out and it took a couple of months and it took a whole pandemic <laughs> to live through it to get there, um, as soon I mentioned it to people, their eyes light up and they're like, oh my God, that sounds so inspiring and that sounds like a solution for a lot of problems, right? Because when you talk about, okay, what do we do now? New work. Okay, how does new work look like? Okay, now we can do a hybrid system. Okay, great. But it doesn't really capture yet the imagination. But 
also from a designer, right? When I think about a office building that is designed with the principles of a resort, that means you're being welcomed, you're being guided to uh, what the opportunities are, the activities that you may be persuaded to that you never expected to. Um, but it's not an activity, it's like, no, let's play baseball. It's actually like, hey, there's a really cool new software that could make your life so much easier uh, and could make your work so much more productive. Why don't I join that club and actually learn how to do the kind of work on this kind of software? How can I use it? Uh, maybe then meet a colleague who becomes a friend where you then create a new unity where you work together with each other, uh, who maybe then becomes a mentor that helps you in your career. Right? So the, all of these kind of new thinkings that are just inspired by thinking differently about the office. Uh, but then, of course, what we are now very busy with, uh, filling that kind of vision with reality, that means uh, how it's organized, the building, how it's being operated, what are the additional programs. Uh, and uh, there's, of course, a lot to do. But um, uh, we have an amazing client uh, who is very, very supportive, going with us every step in the way. And um, yeah, potentially, I could see that actually becoming a real trend. That's amazing, because I can't help but think about all the... Uh, nomad visa initiatives that uh, a lot of the cities around the world, like in Portugal, Estonia, have been launching left, right, and center. And it makes me wonder uh, how they're, they're remaking cities into a different type of cultural melting pots, but specifically when it comes to digital working environments. So I wonder how will that fit within the new space concept that you have for a co-working space? Yeah, I think these countries are incredible smart, right? Because uh, they have a aspirational location where people want to be at. Uh, a lot of people saw not the opportunity to be there because they were like, oh, my headquarters in New York. I got to be in New York. But now the headquarters in New York, but they can also work from Portugal, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and actually the fight for talent, it's enormous, right? And now post-pandemic, it's even bigger, right? You see everywhere. Uh, the people are switching jobs, they're quitting, they're moving, and uh, a lot of companies are now looking to capture these kind of talents. And uh, yeah, you can capture them with experiences that you offer them. And uh, what is so fascinating, actually one of our advisors, uh, Rudy, um, he uh, started uh, way back when a HR software uh, that was sell sold for a lot of money, and now he's investing into very, very interesting new unicorns. And uh, one of them is called Phenom, uh, which is a artificial intelligence driven HR software. And uh, the theory there is that that software engages with the employee uh, in a very playful, experiential kind of fashion to build their career and help them to make the right choices uh, so that uh, it's good for them, but it's also good for the company. And one of the suggestions could be like, maybe for two months, be in Portugal and do the work, but don't quit the job, right? Do what you do there. You can grow, you can get some education, but then you go back. And so there are lot, lots of new things that uh, we can all explore now for basically the betterment of our lives, right? Because why do we do things? Because we want to enjoy things more. Maybe we want to experience something different. Maybe we want to do more meaningful work. And uh, architecture and urbanism, uh, has the opportunity to support that. Now, you're lucky when you're Portugal because it's an affordable, super beautiful place on this planet. Uh, now you may be in, and I don't want to insult anyone, but now I say Bochum in uh, Germany, uh, it may not be able to compete with um, uh, Portugal but uh, as a city yet, but at least the people who are there could start to rethink how you design the city, how do you offer different kind of offerings in the working and the living and the experience kind of uh, arena and then try to become competitive. And the good thing is when it gets to that point, when it is competitive with Portugal, it's going to be a better place. And isn't that great that we create better places for all of us? And when you mention all of us, I mean, it's great to see how excited you are about co-working spaces. But you've also touched upon a, a topic or a demographic that not many architects touch upon, which is the aging population. So what, where, is, where is your interest coming from in this specific domain? 
Well, the interest comes from two things. First of all, a amazing experience in my family where I was living in a three generation household uh, with my parents and my grandmother. And uh, my grandmother at some point um, uh, became very ill and uh, we, and especially my mother, uh, took care of her until the last day. And I was the last person talking to her and I felt when she passed and, uh, and it was incredible painful, but it was also a life lesson, how a family can come together, help each other. And grandmother didn't have to go to a nursing home and just being taken care of there. And uh, we live our lives, right? Uh, it's a life experience there. The second one is um, I'm 50 years old at this point. For me, it's always uh, honesty about the age, right? And also uh, natural aging. I think we should embrace it. And, um, but when I was 40, uh, I realized that I already su surpassed 50% of my life expectancy, right? So when I was 50, it's almost like, well, wherever it is, uh, it's going down. Well, <laughs> I, I met, I, then I met you when you were 40, because we met around like in 2012. Yeah, so it's good yeah, that yeah. we're meeting once a decade. Maybe we should yeah, yeah. more of it. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Yeah, and it was a, actually a very important moment for me um, because with that realization, I was like, now it's halfway done. Uh, life, everything that's ahead of me is incredible precious and I have to make the most out of it. And then I researched with my students what is the reality of aging, right? And you saw, yeah, people are healthier and living longer and so on, but... At a moment in life, a lot of people go into places they don't want to be at. And these are assisted living facilities, nursing homes, and also even retirement communities. Sometimes they sound really kind of fun, but a lot of people after a while realize it's actually not that great, right? Because you're in this kind of compartmentalized society around just older people, and you're not really part of life anymore, as we know it. And in the end, people just want to do the things they like to do also when they're older. Um, the only challenges is that you're maybe socially uh, excluded uh, because you lost a lot of your friends um, or maybe you're not so mobile anymore. Like there are all a lot of different strings that are coming your way uh, when you're getting older. And uh, what I believe is our responsibility to compensate for that. That means we have to look through the lens of older people. Uh, see what the challenges are and find solutions to compensate with it so that people don't have to move into these very specialized uh, environments uh, they don't want to be at, that they can actually stay in the home, they can stay in the cities where they are, they're socially integrated. But all of that doesn't come automatically. We need to be very conscious about it and we have to be active to counter some of the trends and the kind of uh, developments. And one of them, for example, is that we have to make sure that our older people uh, are socially integrated, that they make new friends, that they replenish their networks, because networks, unfortunately, get uh, thinner over time. And, uh, uh, and then we can avoid that people have to move into these uh, specialized places. Uh, because the fact is, in America, 50% of inhabitants in nursing homes are there because of social deficits and not because of physical ones. And when I saw that number, I was like, oh my God, there's so many easy solutions to socially integrate older people. Let's work on them because that's going to make a huge difference. Speaking of the integration though within the community and helping us uh, live a better life regardless of our age, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think the role of technology is in here? I mean, now we're hearing a lot about Web3, Decentraland, what are your takes on these? And do you think they're going to make our lives better? Many of us are burned by technology. Uh, I still remember my own enthusiasm uh, 15 years ago, uh, first time like Facebook. Oh my God, I'm connected to friends. It's also good. This is fun and this is great. I even started a social media company, Archetizer, right in that kind of enthusiasm uh, about connecting people uh, and places uh, and architecture. Uh, and then we saw on the last couple of years, what it did to our society, right? In America, uh, when we think about the Trump times, um, it all, all was part of a result of social media, right? So I think we have to be quite critical about, uh, of course, uh, the tools that we are creating. However, I am still enthusiastic <laughs> about where the journey can go. Uh, and uh, we're also starting to participate. Uh, so we were just recently invited to uh, design something in the metaverse. Uh, we also, um, for Flex, uh, our intergenerational housing uh, concept, 
Uh, we're also thinking about digital the twins uh, and uh, kind of community participation uh, within a building uh, that maybe is open uh, or connected to also the digital world. Because what is very important, you have to remember when you design buildings, we design buildings for people and people are very different. Some of them are introverts, other ones are extroverts, other one can walk other one cannot, and so on. So I feel that digital the extension has the potential to bring people together more strongly, but always with the fusion of the reality of the physical space. And uh, so I don't want to rely on technology, uh, but uh, I want to make sure that if there is an advantage uh, that we can build in through technology, that we take on that advantage uh, and uh, not dismiss it because we're just critical of it. Um, so I don't know if that answered your questions, but uh, so it has these two poles, right? I'm critical. I do have to make sure that our cities work without technology uh, because right, who knows, it could also uh, be a disruption uh, as we experienced with COVID. Yeah, huge disruption. Technology saved us, right? Because we were able to continue work. Can you imagine if that would have not been the case? Uh, it would have been incredible difficult uh, but uh, there are also lingering uh, worries uh, that we just all have to be transparent and open about it and try to address. I think this is the most important lesson to learn is uh, don't be afraid of technology, but uh, it's the idea that technology is a tool, it's not a solution. And many people appro approach it from a solution perspective. And that's why you have like the tulip fever kind of effect on these uh, initiatives or projects like what's happening with the NFT market and how people who bought NFTs for like worth of millions are not, not even able to resell them for a couple hundred dollars. And this is, I think, where uh, we meet like with your architecture firm and what we do at Silverline is we're very excited about the potentials of technology as a tool to better the human experience. Uh, but let's try to explore it while we're trying to understand its impact, both positive and negative. Mm -hmm. So it's a refreshing take. Thank you. Yeah, the, like even um, like for me, it's interesting. Um, I, from time to time, I turn off my phone on the evening on Friday and turn it on again on Sunday. And uh, the 36 hours are incredible. Because first of all, I realized how much I depend on it <laughs> because uh, on Saturday morning, it's like, oh, it's raining. I want to go to the gym. Let's get an Uber. Eh, no Uber, no access to it. Then it's like, oh, I would like to listen to a podcast. Eh, no podcast, right? Now I have to listen to the sounds of the city now. And it actually becomes so much more intense and so much more focused. And I just realized it's really all about putting the technology away and having a whole other relationship to the world. And uh, it's uh, very refreshing. And uh, that also creates a lot of awareness that uh, what we have as a world around us is incredible inspiring. And sometimes we just have to turn off the noise to re-experience it. And uh, still remember a couple of years ago, right? You see people on the phones and they're doing their chats, they do their Tinder and they do all the kind of things. And then you see, a very attractive person just next to that person and like you could just look up and say hello <laughs> and, that no, but, but, just... <laughs> and instead they would try to see if this person is on tinder <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> what can we find out without speaking to them <laughs> <laughs> wait but then but then it is for example the responsibility for an architect is like how can you maybe design a bar that is different, that connects people a little bit more directly. And actually on Fire Island, when we did uh, the Pines Pavilion, we designed the bar with these kind of triangulars uh, so that you were never in line with each other. You were always on a corner with each other. Nice. And it's so much easier to talk to a person when you're over a corner than when you're on a line. And so there are lots of tricks that I think we as architects should always uh, kind of explore and then uh, utilize. Um, to basically also create a world uh, that should function without the technology. You mentioned something about inspiration, but then there is this thin line that divides inspiration with intellectual property theft. Mm -hmm. So uh, in your opinion, what are the main challenges facing architecture and design practitioners when it comes to protecting their IP? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's 
big, big issues. Uh, it's actually interesting when you operate as an architecture in Germany, uh, your work is very protected. And uh, actually, uh, even when your building is built and uh, somebody want to change something, they have to come back to you, ask you for permission and lots of things. Um, in America, I think people would just laugh at you. <laughs> it's like, what uh, about your design? It's like, it's, it's done, right? Um, but uh, it is it is difficult, right? Because uh, we as architects, uh, we always work on new things and to protect it and to benefit from it. What normally people do from innovations and new ideas uh, is really not applicable uh, for us. Um, or I have not really seen it uh, well done. I mean, we try to do slightly different contracts um, where we either way uh, are involved in the equity of a project um, or that there could also be when it's being repeated that we basically get an additional fee for some of our thinkings. Um, but it is uh, still an uphill battle. And uh, I feel it would be very refreshing uh, to see new solutions about it. Um, for me personally, uh, I came to terms to it uh, because I saw a lot of people uh, snatching some ideas left and right. Um, and then my vision is, uh, my business is innovation. So I cannot rely on what I did yesterday. I rely on what I do tomorrow. And I just try to be faster uh, than anyone else. Uh, and I know that people are going to pick back on the resort, uh, work resort idea. Uh, it's just uh, the nature of it. I would love to own it and uh, protect it. But um, I know that it will not be possible. Mm. I, I will leave you with one last thought. Uh, what do you think is the common misconception about architects that you would like to correct? Hmm. Aside from the fact that everyone wears black. <laughs> and I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's true for 99% of architects. Um, yeah, I, I mean, first misconception uh, is when people try to make a choice if they want to become an architect is uh, that uh, they need to know math. <laughs> And uh, it's good to know math, but I think it's good uh, anyway to know, uh, but uh, you don't rely on it uh, because uh, a lot of people who can do the work for you and um, uh, there are a lot of different trades that are really important uh, for architects. Um, I don't know. I think uh, for me, the, the misconception sometimes it's um, for architects. Uh, and I think we also have kind of created that to a certain degree. Uh, it's kind of architecture is in two different fields, right? So there, or maybe even three, uh, but uh, they're like the star architects, right? Where um, a lot of attention is there towards their capabilities, but also towards the performer, uh, the persona. Uh, but then there are also the kind of sweatshops uh, or let's say the ones who are more about production and more commercial and uh, corporate. And, um, that, and then there are the other ones, which are the very intellectual uh, kind of smaller scale that they're researching and uh, theorizing and developing uh, their own kind of path in it. And uh, when you talk about architects, you always put them into one bucket, uh, but uh, there are many different buckets. And I think that kind of realization uh, that uh, there are many different ways and paths a company can take uh, but then also with a different relationship to the client, uh, but that should also be a different way how it's being paid for, uh, the different ways how it should be engaged. Uh, but very often, right, we realize that suddenly we compete with SLCE, which is like a very opportunistic corporate firm in New York. And then we do a proposal and then they look at ours. It's like, okay, why is this higher? Why is this lower here? And then we're like, well, I mean, we invest all of our time into the creativity at the beginning. This is why our fees have to be higher here. And later on, uh, there are different systems in place uh, where maybe also even other companies can take over some of our work. Um, but uh, it would be really good if you would compete more on a leveling field uh, because we are not the same, right? And we have different services, different attention to details. And uh, that's just important that we are uh, judged around that. Mm -hmm. Yes, really, thank you so much for your time and your contribution to our community. It's been wonderful to have you, and I hope we stay in touch for more than a decade, at least during this decade. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and we hope that you've enjoyed this episode. You can subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, iTunes, 
and Rami and YouTube. And don't forget to rate us. And if you have any suggestions, recommendations, or inquiries, you can either send us a DM to our Instagram account, silverline.community, or to our LinkedIn page, or as an email to info at silverline.community.